like such a, a glowing referral to GPO. I know, man. I really, I wish we had that back. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll give it one more time for the recording here. Uh, like no, I said, no, it, GPO, you've, you've done such a wonderful job of, of distilling your message and all the wisdom down into a, a very consumable and scalable pattern. It, it makes sense and it applies in so many different areas. And I think with all of the noise we hear in technology, being able to focus on some things, get a couple of patterns that make sense and apply that in other areas, it it really helps, I think, you know, especially developers of all experience levels become more effective and more confident in what they do. Cool. Thank you very much. That's very kind. Yeah. We have a, a sponsor of QCI. QCI has been a sponsor for the Iowa.net user group since our inception. Uh, we were founded in 2003, coming up on 20 years now of bringing content to the, um, the community. Is QCI here? Do we have anybody who works at QCI that would like to share a, a few words about their company? Doesn't look like we have anybody tonight. Uh, please stick around until after uh, GPA is done. We do have a raffle. We've got some JetBrains licenses or a license that we'll, uh, we'll share. And you can use that in app code too if you happen, happen to be a Swift developer here at the .NET user group. I'm not going to judge. Um, but, and, and GPA, I think that you'd mentioned you might hang around a little bit afterwards and uh, uh, answer questions if people have any of those as well. Is that correct? Absolutely. In fact, uh, I'm actually going to do my talk maybe a little, a little faster than usual and a little shorter than usual because I'd actually rather talk with you than talk at you. So, yep. All right. With that, the famous and handsome G. Pa Hill. Oh my God. <laughs> all right. So hi. Uh, nice to meet you all. I'm G. Pa. That that's a funny name. Uh, it, it, it's a nickname for grandpa, grandfather. And uh, obviously, it, yeah, I look at me, right? I, I look like I'm a grandfather uh, at this point. And so you might think that's where it came from. But actually, it's a kind of a teasing and affectionate uh, nickname that I got a long time ago. I was uh, just 31 years old when I had my first grandchild. And um, my wife's a little older than me, and, and her kids were almost grown up when we got together. And I was presented shortly thereafter with my with my first uh, uh, grandson. And of course, my friends and family thought that the idea of me being a grandfather at age 31 was the funniest thing they had ever heard. And so I became g -Paw. And uh, you can find me out on the internet as g -Paw Hill. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm on Twitter like all the time. I live on Twitter. Um, I'm very easy to reach, and, and my website is gpawhill.org. Uh, I, I want to give you guys a talk tonight. It's called uh, Take Many More Much Smaller Steps. And um, the basic idea is as simple as that. It really is. It says, if you want to get to more value, if you want more value faster, the best way to do that is to take many more much smaller steps. It's a... Uh, uh, it's a much more radical position than it might sound like. If you take a look at this, what, what you'll see is that what I'm really proposing is that um, our project, whatever it is, moving through project space, that the most efficient path that we can take is to fix the stride limit, the steps, the size of the steps, and add a couple of other rules and proceed that way, even though it makes it look like the, the path is inefficient or ineffective in some way. This applies, I mean, here we are with a group uh, uh, focused on code, but actually it, it applies to almost all sorts of change. And, and so I'm here, to, I'm here to shake you up in a way, because I'm here to, to talk to you about why this weird looking path take many more, much smaller steps. Why, how could that possibly be the most efficient thing? And, and so that's my mission, is to, is to dig into that. Uh, the, the, reason those, the, the, the reason that line is jiggy-jaggedy, 
um, from the beginning to the end. I, I'm going to ignore the walking skeleton stuff. If you want to ask me about that afterwards, we can talk about it. But um, the reason it is, it is because primarily because we are limiting the size of our steps. But really, there's three things going on in that picture. For each step, in order to be a step, in fact, we're going to limit its stride. It has to fit in some arbitrary uh, amount of time. If we're talking about just like programming every day, uh, when you're sitting down to the computer, uh, I work in Kotlin mostly. I don't use the, the, the .NET world very much, but a little bit. And they're approximately uh, uh, similar. And I'm talking about well under an hour for a step. And most of my steps are, you know, 10 minutes long. In fact, I start getting itchy at a half an hour and I have to have been pretty prepared in my mind for the fact that it's taking too long and, and resisting that feeling. So that's what I mean when I say that the step size is stride limited. It also has to be activated. Now, activated in, in geek terms, activated means ship it. It means, uh, it, means it goes out, the, it, it's ready to go out the door. Now, it may or may not work for your business to be in a continuous uh, delivery mode. Although I will say that a lot of people thought that that would not work. And then they were somewhat surprised to learn that actually it worked pretty well for them once they learned how to do it. But in principle, in, in your mind, if you had a button uh, down in the corner of your screen that, that said ship it, and that as soon as you press that button, everything in the source code base got shipped out to every user on the planet. If you had that button in theory, if you're willing to click it, then good. That step's close enough to activate it. If you're not willing to click it, then it doesn't meet that criteria. And then the third criterion is you can't go backwards. We, 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 want, we do not want users to experience negative value. Now, something that will, will puzzle some people, but I'm gonna, I'm, I wanna make it clear. All I'm saying is that it doesn't go backwards. I am not requiring it to go forwards. That is, uh, a step can be entirely neutral in terms of user value, not affect the user value at all. And that's just fine. That's completely uh, legal and even occasionally desirable. And so uh, those are the three criteria, stride limited, activated, and non-negative user value. Let's see. Uh, I want to distinguish real quickly between the idea of an action and a step because almost everybody gets these confused. An action is a thing that doesn't <laughs> result in shippability, right? It's really, I guess it's really that simple. Um, if I wanted to be the cool kid on my block and I decided to replace my handlebars with really sexy swoop back handlebars with the neon orange grips and lots of rainbow ribbons coming out of the back of the grips. If I wanted to do that, I would take several actions. I, I would loosen the, the, the fork uh, nut. I would slide out the old handlebars. I would slide in the new handlebars. I would tighten the fork nut. That's four different actions. But all together, those four actions are just one step by this definition of step that I'm trying to give you. And, and as we look at some of the other diagrams, I will, I'll try to constantly keep these colors. The blue is the actions, the whatever that purpley violet color is, that's the actual step. Steps have to fit, that's important, but they have to ship, they have to go live. And the step is literally the gap between the moment where I become unshippable to the moment where I become shippable again. It is literally the elapsed amount of time in between those two. It has nothing to do with how many activities might make up that step. Hopefully that's clear. Of course, the idea of all this is the, the red ball is, is what we invest. It's, it's the amount of money we have to come up with in order to take a step. And what we get out of it potentially is uh, is the reward as soon as that as that step ships. Now, of course, not all steps, like I say, generate extrinsic benefit. They don't necessarily generate benefit for the user. Nevertheless, uh, I keep that in the in the frame just just so you can see it. So, what's this really about? 
you get up, you, you pet the dog, you get coffee, you go sit down at your machine and, and you start to work. And the thing is, there's a bazillion actions you could possibly take. And, and that's true for everybody, but it's certainly true of a programmer looking at code. There's, there's so many things you could do. What this idea is about is helping you pick the ideal, the preferred, the necessary actions that you want to do. So here's some that we're going to reject. This guy marked number one here, this big purple arrow. Well, we're going to reject that, that action uh, or that step because the step is too big. It will be too long between the time I become unshippable and the time I become shippable. And, and then these guys over here marked number two. The reason we're not doing those, they're perfectly, they're well within this radius of size that's okay, but they make things worse. And we've kind of forbidden making things worse. So we reject those. Now, what about these blue ones? Well, remember the blue, these guys are actions. Even though I, I draw an arrow here, there's no step because I can't ship after this blue thing is ready here. Even if I have a chain of these, and this is a very, very common situation for, for developers uh, and their planners to, to try to chain together actions into a sequence. Uh, these, none of these are steps. This is sleight of hand. The step in this case is the enormous step from where we are now all the way to where we end up. And, and the fact that we can arbitrarily break it down into a bunch of actions doesn't change that fact because none of those actions are actually shippable. So having said that, there's still plenty of options that we could take. And you look at most things and, and, and you'll see this right away. It's, it's lots and lots of choices. And look at this guy. Number one's a possibility. Number two is really attractive. Although there's something really compelling about number three. And what is that? It, it's, it's the path. It, it's the fact that even though this first step takes us off to the side and hardly delivers any value at all, once we have done it, we can see exactly the path we would take to get to the horizon. Whereas when we're thinking about the second step, or I mean this number two step up here, then I don't know, maybe we can, maybe we can't. And, and that's what makes this third option actually kind of attractive. Just the fact that you, you know, to the extent that we all ever know anything, what the steps are that will get us successfully to our horizon goal. So, I'm going to compare and contrast that to what we do out in the trade these days. Oh my God. <laughs> Here's what we do. Before the first sentence is out describing the problem, I know you guys do this. Everybody does this. Everybody in our trade does it anyway. We are already dividing the problem into sub problems. We are already uh, getting ourselves a puzzle picture, like this jigsaw puzzle, where I have part A and part B and part C, and they're going to connect in this and that, 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 that. So in today's popular model, what we do is we decompose our problems up front using this kind of technique. And, and we spend various amounts of money being sure that, as sure as we can be, that these curves are right and that the knob sticking out has a corresponding hole in the other puzzle piece and so on. And then we take these guys and we divvy them up amongst our teams or inside a team amongst our individuals. And then at some point, we're going to put it all together and we're going to have a finished and final and complete puzzle. It is going to be great. We're just going to have a, the most wonderful time. It looks like, visually, it looks kind of like this, as opposed to, to moving across a project space in the way that the the most efficient path thing does. This one looks like this. You determine the target, you then identify those final parts, and then you divvy it all up and everybody works on parts until some point where we assemble all the final parts. And then we're at the end of this process. And an important rationale for this is, and then we'll never change it again. 
that's just the beginning of all the things that are wrong with this model. The beginning of, the, of all the things that are wrong with this model is simply the idea that we finish software because we don't, right? There was a time when we did. There, there was a time when, when uh, uh, you know, you take these short little gigs, you do this work for, for a client of some, of some sort or another, and it would be one month or it'd be three months and that's it. Boom, bam, we're done. That doesn't help happen anymore because uh, of, of the way software is made because of the size of the software that we use, because it is ridiculously cheap to distribute software, to keep updating software continuously, to draw in larger and larger markets over time. Because of that, software kind of never finishes. So that's my idea, the most efficient path. Now, I think we're going to talk about these weird balls I put at the end of every one of them. The red is at the beginning of each one, and, and it's the, the cost of taking the step. The green, and you'll notice, if you look really closely, this guy here in the center, he doesn't have a green ball. Why not? Well, because he didn't actually generate any benefit in terms of user value. And that is, is what the green ball actually represents. It represents uh, the benefit that we get out of, uh, <clears throat> I mean, from the user's point of view um, uh, across each step. It could be larger or smaller, depending upon the step, and it could be nothing at all, depending upon the step. <clears throat> yeah, and here I am. And the, uh, and the third blue circle, which is there looking back at every single one of these completion points, is actually critical to understanding what makes this path so efficient. The blue circle represents the intrinsic benefit of taking small steps. All right, let me give you the case in detail. I know not very much detail. Like I said, I'd like to get this over with and then we can actually talk with each other. Um, software isn't plain geometry. I, I, so much reasoning about how we plan software and how we put it together and so on is based on the idea that, that, that we're all junior Euclids and, and that we're learning how to, how plain geometry works. But, you know, not only is software not plain geometry, but most of the things that you actually make any sort of plan for or arrangement for are also not plain geometry. The shortest distance between two points is, is a straight line, right? Well, I don't have any beer. I, 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 uh, beer is over at Ashley's, which is about a mile that way, almost a, almost a mile and a half that way. And it would be insane of me to traverse that straight line because it ain't a plane. <laughs> it's not a flat Euclidean plane between my house and Ashley's uh, country market. So that's that element. The second one is the, is, is the element that directed parallelization doesn't scale. Everybody thinks it scales. And of course, the safe advocates say, sure, it does. It scales perfectly. But I have not experienced a whole lot of very happy safe houses. So I would have to say that uh, I think they're kidding themselves. Directed paralyz parallelization doesn't scale. What happens is that um, the problem is, is like an NP complete problem. And uh, a, a little bit harder on the input side, it, it makes it not just harder on the output side, but harder, right? The more balls you put in the air, the harder it is to pull it off. The third point I already touched on, steps have intrinsic value. Completing a step is actually provides a whole ton of intrinsic value. And finally, actual changeability costs less than classical theory. And, and what is the classical theory? I, I call it the RAT, rework avoidance theory. The idea behind rework avoidance theory is simply that it is inefficient to ever change the same thing twice. And so we're trying to avoid changing the same thing twice. And we go to tremendous lengths to try to avoid this. And in fact, the, the, the lengths to which we go are part of why rework avoidance theory doesn't actually work. So that's the case in detail. I'm going to lay it out, even all four of these, a little more closely. All right. Oops, wrong direction. Uh, we already kind of covered this idea. 
So first of all, if, if I'm going to go to Ashley's, the first thing that's going to happen to me is I'm going to fall off the, the second floor deck and probably break my ankles because it's about 15 feet. But wait, that's not all. Because now I got to go down about a 45 degree ridge filled with trees. But wait, that's not all. When I get to the bottom of that ridge, I'm going to confront the Rockfish River, which is certainly weightable. Uh, but at this point, you know, I'm pretty tired and my ankles really, really hurt. And I'm going to paddle my way across this fairly shallow river. And then that's not all. I'm going to climb up another 30 degree grade. So the point of all this is that the surface actually has obstacles. It always has obstacles. And it, it has them just as it has them in real life when we're talking about getting the sales of beer at the country store. It, it has them in software life. And most people would do much more effectively if they learn to go around obstacles instead of aiming straight at the target. It, it gives the lie to this whole idea about the shortest distance. The second aspect of this Unlike myself, uh, the vehicle that we drive when we're developing software, when it's moving through uh, a software space, through project space like this, modifies itself. Imagine you're driving your car and as you're driving it, the steering wheels change shape. <laughs> the, uh, the tires become mag slicks instead of, uh, instead of ordinary car tiles except for the front right one, which becomes a bicycle tire. You get the point. The vehicle changes as you move it across this path. That's, that's once again, going to make it much, much harder to calculate or compute or plan any sort of shortest distance. And then finally, bottom line, both the target and the obstacles move. Unlike the Rockfish River, which stays pretty much year by year where it is right now. The actual obstacles in, 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 in software move all the time. They move because the tech changes. They move because your staff changes. They move for all sorts of complicated reasons. And of course, this whole idea of the finished and final product, right? The idea of a target that is fixed. Well, the target changes constantly constantly in software development. So all of this reasoning about uh, the flat plane and how much more efficient it would be to go straight at our target in one massive optimized parallelized step, well, it doesn't hold up. Next up, a directed parallelism doesn't scale. Okay, what are we talking about? We're talking about with these two lines, the blue line here is showing what it costs us to lay bricks. I got, this is how much effort it takes, depending upon how many bricks we're trying to lay. If it takes me one unit of effort to lay one brick, to lay 100 bricks takes me about 100 units of effort. Linearity, it's called. But juggling bricks is a very different matter. With juggling bricks, uh, each additional brick, like I said before, it doesn't just make, make the problem bigger. It makes the problem bigger-er. The problem size, complexity, and difficulty goes up much faster than adding more bricks. In fact, the absolute uh, human limit, you, you may not know this. Do you, do you know what the, the Guinness Book of World Records is for juggling, not bricks, but for juggling balls? Uh, the definition of in order to pass it, the first ball has to go completely around the circle uh, twice. And if it does so, then they say that's how many balls you have juggled. Well, you see this red arrow here and it starts to go straight up right near the very end. The Guinness Book of World Records is contested by two people, one of whom uh, has witnesses, the other whom did it on video. It is 11 balls. That's all. Just 11 balls. 
Now, how many of you work in an organization that has uh, an IT department with mm, 100 people in it? I bet you got more than 11 teams. Right. Directed parallelism does not scale. Why? Because to do parallelism well, you have to, you have to synchronize everything. You have to control everything. You start adding weight states. You start, you start dying from overruns, very slight overruns that cost you horrors. In fact, those of you in the room who've ever worked with multi-threaded applications know just exactly how wildly expensive and complicated multi-threading actually is. And I, I would say that no geek who's worked more than five years in the trade would ever prefer to solve a problem using multiple threads, right? I'd never go, I'd be like, well, let's see, I could do this in a single thread or I could do it with 119 threads. Nobody ever says, oh, I think 119 would be the best way to do this. Directed parallelism doesn't scale very well. That's the second of my four points. Now we get to the real guts of this whole thing, which is this blue circle I was talking about before. Intrinsic benefit. Every one of these small steps actually carries with it, maybe not every one of these every time, but potentially at least six different huge, huge benefits. The first one is, now I'm going to start in the middle here, steerability. Uh, I don't know if you've ever worked in an organization where in, uh, a, a marketing team drives you, but a lot of people have. I certainly have worked with, with teams who were delivering software for marketing people. Marketing people will come in and make you swear to God that they will actually swear to God that all they want you to do is X. And after five days of working on X, they will come in their room and they will say, I can close a $30 billion deal if you'll just stop working on X and start working on Y. That's steerability. Why is steerability better in this, uh, in this many more much smaller steps approach? It's because, of, it's because of the shipability requirement. What it means is that there are more possible places to steer, to change the direction in which we're going without actually losing the work that we already did. And it's very closely related, of course, is interruptibility. Um, I know it is a really famous trope for developers to, to tell me that, you know, every interruption costs them the entire day. Um, and it, it's a fate worse than death and da, 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 never, you know, never call them, never slack them, never talk to them. I get it. I used to be like that myself. And I'll tell you what happened to me. What I learned was that it has to be that way with the, with the four big screens and the 300 tabs open and the six books and the architecture diagram and the tens of thousands of lines of code that you have to study. It has to be that way because we built it so that it had to be that way. Because our steps either are not at this time or have not all along been steps that were small enough to actually allow me to do one little thing, just one little thing. Take a little tiny step. Boop, 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 boop. Now my boss comes in the room. Hey, what are you doing? What if I'm in the middle of such a step, such a coding step? I'll say, give me 10 minutes. Just give me 10 minutes. And then I'll answer that question. So steerability and interruptibility, closely related. The reason many more small, much smaller steps works uh, uh, to achieve that is essentially because there are so many more places where I'm done. I mean, the ultimate story isn't done, doesn't matter. And what's done is this thing that I had to focus on for long enough to, to, to be able to keep it in my code base and continue using it. All right, what about reversibility? Well, so a lot of people think that I mean, rever I, I need to change this name, I guess. But when I say reversibility, I don't mean that you take a small step and then you immediately take it back, although that does some, sometimes happen. What more often happens is that you get two different steps and they form a kind of V where 
you know, I took this first step and then I take the second step and actually it moves it really quite close to where I was when I first started. Um, that's what I mean when I say reversibility. And it's really important because of the shifting terrain, because of the fact that the target and the obstacle and the vehicle are all undergoing change at the same time. That's why reversibility is really important. These other three are actually have more to do with, with or anyway, the top two, grok ability and rhythm have more to do with the nature of humans. I, I don't know how many of you all uh, do test-driven development. If you don't do test-driven development, I, I advocate it in the strongest possible terms. And, uh, uh, and I, hope, I hope everybody's like, well, of course we do test-driven development. But when you do test-driven development, you run your tests, right? You run your tests all the time. And they go, they, <coughs> they go red, red jiggle 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 red jiggle 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 green and when they go green okay i'm not gonna say that you all do this but i'll tell you what i often do i run the tests they're green i go <laughs> and then you know what i do i i run them again i haven't changed anything they go green again i go <laughs> run them again green 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 what am i doing I'm using drugs. That's what I'm doing. I'm tapping up a vein and I'm putting, uh, oh, I'm an old man. I just made that funny joke and now I can't finish it. And I'm putting endorphins into my body. That's it. I remember the word endorphins. What I'm doing when I do that is I'm experiencing what happens when you have tension and then you release it. The other name for having tension and then releasing it is called rhythm. When I take many more, much smaller steps, I get rhythm. I get a dose of endorphins every time I finish a step. People think that this kind of thing doesn't matter, but it matters enormously in terms of our ability to sustain our focus and our interest and our enthusiasm across any length of time. I know that a lot of folks think that um, delayed gratification is the answer to every problem. It is not the answer to getting dopamine <laughs> into your system. It's, it's really not the answer. It, it, delayed gratification doesn't help you because two things. One, the dose that you get is not correspondingly very much bigger than the dose you got from the little small step. So that's one aspect of it. And the second aspect of it is, even if the dose were enormous, your body can only use so much of it at one time. And so what happens is you just wind up peeing it out. And, and literally, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about when I talk about rhythm, is this process where we build a little tension, then we release the tension. Then we build a little tension, and then we release the, the, the tension. And what we're doing is we're abusing drugs for our benefit, the benefit of our team, and the benefit of our company. Okay, so that's rhythm. Grok ability, I don't know if you guys know this word, Grok, uh, Robert, uh, Robert A. Heinlein coined it, God, 50 years ago? I bet, 50, on the order of 50 years ago. Uh, he had this, uh, this guy from Mars who was on Earth, and um, he had the ability to instantly grasp concepts. So he didn't think, he didn't learn, he didn't study, he didn't read, he got it in an instant. Grokability is one of the things that we get from taking very small steps because we're reducing our mental scope down to a size where it really is possible to just glance and get it. If I glance at this, I get it. That's what grokability is about. And the reason it's so important is actually it's the same picture as if we were looking at... Um, as if we were looking at juggling bricks versus laying bricks, right? Again, because in fact, your, your ability to hold things in your head and manipulate them is severely limited in size, dramatically so. Most people grossly underestimate this. A guy, uh, uh, George Miller, uh, did, a, did, did a, uh, a proposition back in 1954 based on uh, what his graduate students were doing in psychology, and they were testing various aspects of human abilities. And he realized that he kept seeing the same number over and over again in the final analysis data. And that number was uh, five, uh, 
uh, seven plus or minus two, right? And that, he wrote a very famous uh, paper and gave a very famous talk, talk, uh, talk about this. And what he was proposing is that the bandwidth of the human brain for all humans is somewhere between five and nine things at once. Now, since then, what, 60 odd years have gone by? And that proposition has been tested thousands and thousands of times in myriad different experiments. And the universal modern belief is that he was wrong, completely wrong, totally wrong. Yeah, it's really actually more like five plus or minus one. Seven plus or minus two is too big. Humans are not very good at holding things in their head. What they are pretty damn good at is drawing imaginary clumps and then giving them made up names that don't correlate to anything. And then they manipulate that clump. It's called a chunk, believe it or not, in technical psych circles, in manipulating chunks. They are pretty good at that. And that's what makes it seem like they're handling more ideas than they actually are. That's grokability. Last one, multi-targeted. So remember I said directed parallelism doesn't scale, but target parallelism does. Why? Because I can have two teams contributing steps to the same code base at the same time, or almost exactly the same time, in such a fashion that two different targets can be achieved in the product at the same time. In fact, what you can actually do is if your steps are small enough, it becomes not just technically more feasible to do five things at the same time, but it also becomes politically easier to make decisions. I don't know if you've ever sat in uh, up at the big levels uh, where, where the suits play, but one of the things that they do the most about is you got five people in the, in the room and they're all 800 pound gorillas, right? And they, you know, this is your great, great, great grandboss. And they sit around and they argue with each other about what is the most important thing to do. And the reason that that argument is so fraught is because that will determine their course for six months, for eight months, for nine months, because you can only do one thing at a time, according to that old model. So those fights become brutal. And the fact that mm, department A uh, is maybe not as important as what department B wants means that A will get shut out for months and never get the functionality or the feature that they want. So these, these fights up, up there in that room are actually a very big deal. Target parallelism allows us to actually, because of the finer grain provided by the size of the steps, allows us to mix and match. I can be working 10 units of work, 10 steps on the most important thing, but then seven steps on the other guy's thing. And I can be doing them interactively. That's because of the granularity of, of the size of those steps. So you can see, I spent a lot of time on this one extremely unattractive slide. It is, it is because this concept is so important. The blue circle represents the intrinsic benefit of just taking smaller steps. Last fourth point, changeability. Changeability is actually not as hard as everybody tries to make it. And the reason it is so hard is because we haven't been trying to build changeable things, right? Remember, our, our, our rework avoidance theory says we divide the product into these fixed puzzle pieces that are gonna be the final thing. Those things are not changeable. We, we, we're not even trying to make them changeable. That's the problem. Path-focused design is an example of a, a changeability technique where actually, what we're actually doing is we're purposefully plotting our path using stride-limited steps instead of ever breaking the limit of the stride. That means we have to throw out the idea of finality, of a finish line, of permanence. We basically learn to just love change simply accept and even embrace change. Now, those of you who, who've ever looked into extreme programming might notice that that terminology comes from there. The subtitle of the book uh, that Kent Breck wrote years and years ago called uh, Extreme Programming Explained 
The subtitle was Embrace Change. This sounds harder than it is. And the reason it's harder than it, that it sounds hard is because you haven't been trying it. Instead, what you've been trying to do is take steps and then shrink them as small as they can be while still always being aimed straight at the target and always being uh, whew, God, aging. I hope aging never happens to any of you. Wait, no, that's not right. Always being aimed at the target and um, always being uh, and being completely indifferent to the size of a step. It's simply we are trying to avoid rework. So to give you an example, when we do a login screen, right? The first thing that they're going to tell you about a login screen is 25 things it has to do. Right? It's got to remember people who've been here before. It's got to have a I forgot my password option. It's got a this and that and the other and the other and the branding and the all oh, da, 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 da. And that the reason they do that is because it has never occurred to them that you could just give them a, a username and a password today. And tomorrow, we'll go back and change that code to add, I need my password changed, or any of the other things that we have to do. The problem is that people just aren't looking for those opportunities. That's why they don't see them. Changeability and test-driven development. Well. The, one of the great powers of, of test-driven development is, is that it has automated consequence detection. When you do something, um, if it breaks things, you find out. You're the first person to find out. That is of enormous benefit in terms of, of changeability. It also actually lends us strength as context switchers. Uh, I, I, I can easily... Um, I guess those last two are kind of similar, context switching and collaboration support. You know, the tests in TDD are an executable document. You can send me to any piece of code that is a well-tested piece of, uh, a well-TDD piece of code. And I guarantee you, I will understand it far more quickly than if you sent me to any other piece of code that isn't backed up by executable tests. That is collaboration support. That's what enables me to collaborate with you on your code. I don't have to know what your big problem is. I have to know what test you're working on. Once I do that, I'm in. I know how to do that. I see, how, I see what this test is supposed to do. Let's try this. Let's try that. Blah, blah, blah. Collaboration support and the ability to jump from one part of the system to another part of the system are both very heavily backed by test-driven development. And of course, so is rhythm. There's more techniques that we can adopt for changeability. When we work by story, we're actually, that's helping us with our changeability. Most stories up at that level, my time uh, uh, gap, instead of being 15 minutes to an hour or something like that for code, I would urge that um, a team consider adopting a, a story size such that we never work on any story that we think is longer than a day, one team day and a half. That would be very hard for a lot of, folks to get their head around, but it's critical to, to start by limiting the stride. You cannot get there by taking larger steps. You can only get there by taking smaller steps. The stories work to narrow the focus as far down as we can. Of course, we still need even smaller steps than that when we actually go to code them. Pairing and mobbing are critical. Um, they maximize our ability to interact with each other and to learn from each other in, in an amazing and incredible way. They also smooth energy out and problems. I, I don't know if you guys have ever had a bad week, but, but sometimes I have a bad week. Something goes bad. My, you know, my wife gets sick or my dogs or, or, or my grandkids call me and I need to go someplace in a hurry and do something. When, when that happens and I'm not mobbing, and not pairing. When that happens, all work stops. When I'm pairing and mobbing, though, it's no big deal. Well, a hiccup, but that's all it is, just a little hiccup. Smoothing our availability and energy is a big factor in, in helping us uh, change things, and pairing and mobbing does that. I am an advocate of both trunk-based development and of a pull and swarm. You may not know this pull and swarm technique. Um, 
you know, Scrum's sort of taken over everything in the world and everybody, you know, does a meeting and we have this meeting and then we pick the stories and then we use a thing, it's called Jira. Okay, no, it's not. But anyway, whatever. This Jira thing, right? Where we load up our capacity, we've built our schedule, we've made our commitments, right? I don't know, I, I don't recommend that. I think it should pull and swarm. I think most teams should pull and swarm. What it means is this. What's the next story? Let's pull that story and start working on it. All of us. We can work on it um, as a mob, which I already mentioned. We could do a quick split between two pieces of it and break into two smaller mobs or two pairs or anything like that. We could send out a scout to find out something that we established in the first hour is gonna be an important question and get back to us while the rest of us plug away on the parts that don't depend on the answer to that question. Pull and swarm means pull one story, ship the story, pull another story. Um, it's a great way to work. And it's a, it's a very advanced changeability technique. It is one of the things that lets us uh, react to the change that is out there in the world. Instead of, I don't know if you've ever done this. Oh God, what am, who am I kidding? Of course you've done this. If you've been in a scrum thing with the Jira thing and the board, do you ever find yourself halfway through the work when somebody adds 12 more stories? Yes, of course you have. So then mm, let's say you're being strict and you say, well, these 12 story points came in. So therefore we're gonna take out these 12 story points that we had in there already. Let's say you're being strict, that's great. That's excellent, I'm glad to hear it. Here's the thing, all the work you did thinking about those 12 story points that are no longer in the sprint is waste. Dad, nabbit. I spent a bunch of time talking to a bunch of people, looking at code, thinking about features, trying to hassle the customer to define this story more clearly. All of those things, all of that effort, it's gone. Because you know what? Those 12 story points are likely to never actually hit another sprint. You tell yourself, well, we're going to start those on Monday after the finish of this sprint. That's not what happens most of the time. So pull and swarm, pull and swarm. The trunk-based thing, I don't know. I feel like I'm running out of time. The trunk-based thing, uh, it just works better, guys. It just works better. It, it's exactly like years and years ago when we first started doing continuous integration. Everybody said, it's insane. You'll for I hate merging and you'll force me to merge every hour. Are you kidding me? And the answer is, no, I'm not kidding you. And the reason why it works is because it's only an hour's worth of changes. Now, I'll be honest with you. I never merge. I take steps that are small enough in my code base that if some bozo has forced me to manually do a merge by changing the code while I was doing my 15 minute step, you know what I do? I throw away my 15 minute step. It's just typing. Typing is not the bottleneck. The hard part of taking that step was actually figuring out what to do. And that I still have, and I'm still perfectly capable of doing again. In fact, much faster than I did it when I did it the first time. So, Trunk-based all the way. Let's see, you're about done. There's no free lunch. You got to unlearn a bunch of stuff. You got to unlearn pre-committing to some final goal. You got to, ultimately, you're going to have to let go of a lot of hierarchical command and control because that hierarchical command and control is what we're talking about when we're talking about, uh, <coughs> when we're talking about directed parallelism does not scale. Um, Ultimately, you have to get low, get uh, out of additive production reason. Um, what I'm talking here about is linearity, but not, uh, uh, compared to nonlinearity, people need to get a really good grasp early on on the distinction between those two, uh, uh, between laying bricks and juggling bricks. And then they need to determine what things in their world are actually more like juggling bricks than they are like laying bricks. That will help. That's the start. That's what I mean when I say get, getting rid of additive production reasoning. There's lots and lots to learn. TDD, path-focused design. You can learn mobbing and pairing. You can learn how to swarm. You can do all those things, but, but you, you got to want to. You got you to gotta choose and decide this is what we're going to do. Um, let's see. One more thing. Uh, forget the walking skeleton. If you have questions about it, you can ask me afterwards. Adopt the three criteria. We want every step to be shippable to be smaller uh, than our predetermined step uh, duration and to not go backwards. 
So just adopt those criteria. Third, use multiple teams adding steps to approach the minimum viable product. And then once you actually get to the field and your minimum viable product is shipping, repeat, keep going, keep doing it again and again and again. That's the gist of my talk. Uh, effective change looks like this. Do, 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 do. Walking our project through a, a complex manifold space by taking little tiny steps over and over and over again. And in, the thing about it is I, I retitled this slide, even though I've shown you this picture 25 times already, to be effective change. And we've been talking about change in code. But in fact, this is actually stuff that is independent of whether you're changing code or you're changing process or you're changing yourself or you're changing your organization. So the closing question is, what kind of change do you want to make? I want to change all these things. I want to change our code and ourselves and our process. I want to change our teams and our organization and our trade. And ultimately, I want to change our world. And taking many more, much smaller steps seems to work in my life for all of those levels and all of those different kinds of change. All right, that is it for me. I'll tell you what, guys. Um, I don't know how, how long you guys want to hang around, but what I'm going to do is dash outside and then come right back in a couple minutes. So maybe we all take a quick bio break or grab a fresh beer and, uh, and meet back here or whoever wants to hang and chat. Tell you what, while you, while you take a step out, um, I'm going to, to do a couple of housekeeping items, do our giveaway, now it's the next one. Yep. And, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to delay until you get back. Cool. And then- I'll I'll be just five minutes tops. And then I'll leave like three to five story points left of time in rally. Okay, good. Unless we can get an extension. I don't know. But if it does, we'll just, we'll, we'll flop it over to the next sprint. Nobody will notice. Okay. Right oh, I feel dirty for saying that. All right. All right, so uh, thumbs up on that, huh? Okay, so we've got, um, hopefully you're seeing my screen here. Do you guys see the wheel of names? Good, good, good. Visual indicators. I. I think I, I think I've got everybody on here. Um, can somebody let me know if they do not see their name on that list? And, uh, and if you don't, oh wait, we got somebody new here. I see a new person. Sean Wee, am I saying that right? All right. So this is for our, uh, intelligent or our JetBrains license. Uh, with a JetBrains license, you can get ReSharper, uh, Rider, which is the new, or not the new, but it's the, uh, the IDE for uh, doing .NET development. You can replace a C Sharp or a Visual Studio with that. Um, IntelliJ, App Code, what have you. So here we go. Drum roll in your head. <laughs> All right, Chris, congratulations. Yippee. <laughs> Chris, um, I think I have your email, but can you do me a favor and just ping me either like in the chat or on Twitter or email, or if you want to write your email on a can of beer and drop it off at my house here in Altoona, that would be acceptable as well. That works. You know how to get all of me, buddy. Yeah, I'll shoot, I'll shoot you a message. Thanks. Put it, put it inside of the, the latest book that you've been reading. Will do. What is it anyways? What is the latest book you've been reading? I've been hitting full sight again on Angular, so. Very cool. For those of you that don't know Chris, Chris is a voracious learner, loves reading, loves learning, uh, usually has great recommendations for me. So nice work. 
All right. And next week or next month for our uh, .NET user group, let me see if I've got the date here first. Looking it up here. I had an hour to look it up, obviously. So enthralled with what GPA was saying. All right, May 5th, Cinco de Mayo, another evening session. We've got uh, Chet Hendrickson. And if you don't know Chet, I've had the pleasure of having dinner with him and meeting him a couple of times. Um, Chet was one of the people who was on that Chrysler C3 project. And if you're not aware, the Chrysler C3 project was back in the late 90s and was one of the, the big XP pair programming, test-driven development, um, all those crazy things that have become our standard today, that's where it happened. Uh, it was back at Chrysler. And um, Chet was there when, when user stories were created. And all the things that we hear now about user stories um, may have drifted a little bit from where it all started and what their intent was. So I've asked Chet to come in and talk with us and kind of share like what happened at the beginning. What was the intent of all this? What have we learned? How have things gone? Um, and if nothing else, if nothing else, I'm interested in gaining a little bit more history and knowledge for myself. So the next time I have somebody confidently telling me exactly the perfect way to do user stories, I can have a little bit of evidence that maybe, maybe they're not completely correct. Maybe I just have a little actually in my back pocket to mm -hmm. uh, guide the conversation someplace a little bit more helpful. So that'll be uh, next Thursday. Well, our next one will be Thursday, May 5th. And I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to that. All right, uh, let's see, taking a look at the comments in here. Our chat, let's see. Uh, had a question here about video. We are recording and this will be available out on YouTube as soon as I can. Um, that will, we'll post it out on YouTube. Uh, I'll, I'll give my, myself a deadline by Sunday, if not earlier. So if you wanted to watch this again, or if you wanted to have a good, um, lunch and learn with your team, GPA was pro recording. He is, uh, quite energetic and trying to get, uh, good, simple messages to help people out across the board. Absolutely. I, um, you get a beverage. I, I, I uh, well, yes, I do have a beverage. Um, the, uh, this stuff is really important. The, I, I don't know how you all feel about the trade, but I just hate it. This is not the trade I joined. Um, this is not what I, I mean, I didn't set out to be a geek anyway. It just kind of happened. But, the reason it happened is it was such a blast to apply myself creatively and techni technically to solve, you know, lovely problems, real problems for actual real people. And our trade doesn't feel like that anymore for most of the people who come into it. When I started in 1980, there were 100,000 geeks in the world or 100,000 software developers. There are 26 million today. And I don't think most of them are nearly as happy as I was when I started out. And, um, and I, I want to change that. And it's not just because I'm a hippie, uh, you know, with love beads and stuff like that. Although for the record, I am a hippie with love beads and stuff like that. It, it's because it's grossly ineffective to try to structure our lives uh, in such a way that we pretend that, uh, that people who do creative uh, technical work are basically glorified fancy typists. And, uh, and one of the things that happened to me was I developed this 
this idea of noticing when my changes worked and when they didn't. And I started studying it. And there's really three planks to my idea. But the first one is this many more, much smaller steps. Sorry, I just went off there. I, I didn't even take a sip yet. You, you got time for mixer if you want. No, no. I actually, believe it or not, I have strict rules about that. Look, if you're going to, you know, I'm the sort of person who wants to know that I am putting poison in my body to, you know, fill the hole or whatever it is, and not to be lulled into, you know, drinking 29 watermelon shooters. Not that I have ever done that. But, you know, I've read about it. <laughs> so, you know, I don't use mixers. Is that where the seven plus or minus two rule also applies? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So any questions for me or comments or, or snark or anything really at all? Feel free. I feel like I used up a bunch of our time, but I'm still totally open. And I want to pause really quick there too, as far as time goes, we are at that time now where people come in or can, can take off as they please, mm -hmm. you know, um, oftentimes we may, we might stick around here for a while because, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of friends and we, we chat. So, you know, feel free to kind of take off as you want and talk as you want. And I'll stop talking. Or yeah, maybe we could just not talk. Let's just be with each other. There so, were some. I guess, uh, th there uh, were some questions in the in the chat, uh, Mike. Okay, I'm looking. Is that about the non -mon or the monotonous work? Dopey's question about, about pairing. One about pairing and, and, and when you shouldn't pair, especially for monotonous work. And then I saw, and then someone else had a, a good one. And I think then someone had a good question about how do you let go of hierarchical command and control in mm -hmm. a hierarchical organization? And I think the answer to that one is always, well, it depends. <laughs> I know, right? Well, let me tell you, that's why they pay me the big bucks. <laughs> 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 um, okay, so first the pairing question. Um, why are you doing monotonous work? There's one thing that computers are awesome at. They don't ever get bored. They don't have a problem doing monotonous work. Most of the monotonous work that, that people have to do in, in modern software organizations is actually something that a computer could do just fine. But it comes back to that thing, right? If you want it that way, you have to build it that way. You got to, you know, you got to, you got to say, we're not a place that does monotonous work. And, you know, we'll, we'll take the time to make it, you know, it's interesting because solving monotonous work is not monotonous. Solving that kind of stuff is actually quite a bit of fun. So, so now having said that, I don't want to come off as a hardliner. Yeah. I, I, I usually pair mob and solo on them on the order if you just leave me to my own devices or or i have my own victim team and they have to do what i say i do that like one third one third one third um it's, you know pairs are great for me for helping me drill in mobs are great for learning and solos are great for you know i'll tell you something i, I hate in a mob watching some other idiot drive google I don't know. I just do. I'm like, no, no, not the second one. The third one. No, no. Scroll past that. That's the intro. No, no, the picture, the picture, the picture. You know, <laughs> if I have to go, if I have to go, if I have to research something, if I have to study an API, uh, I'm not usually going to do that in any way, but by myself, I'm usually perfectly happy to do that. Whoa. Immersive view. I've never seen that. That's sexy. <laughs> so um encouragement for people to put their cameras on have a seat at the table 
Now, the question about the hierarchy is actually really, of course, a very difficult question. You want to know how I do it? I cheat. Um, you leave? Prod. If you go to a person who is in charge uh, of a team and you say, you no longer in charge, that's not effective. <laughs> I mean, it isn't. And, and it's only natural that that person is going to say, wait a minute, let me show you the org chart. I very much am in charge. But um, instead, you have to sort of back into it. You have to, you have to sidle up to it. I worked uh, recently with a team, uh, a large, a large org. I mean, not huge, but you know, about 150 geeks maybe. And uh, there was this one group I worked with. There were five people, and in the middle of this huge hierarchical organization, the boss just basically told them, "I'd like you guys to solve this problem. Go, go." <laughs> That's it. That's all she did. And the reason is because she trusted them. And that trust is the key to letting go of, of, of this idea that the only way to, to control things is hierarchically. I mean, technically, that's still a hierarchy, right? But it isn't a micromanagerial one. Mm -hmm. And it isn't the, the idea isn't that one person at the top knows as much as the five that are working underneath them. It's much more of a, this is my problem. Can you solve it? And when they say yes, you're like, okay, then go solve that. And if they'd said no, maybe we had a conversation to throw out a different problem. Now, I want to stress, not all of the teams in that org were like that. This happened because these people were good. The better you are as a team, the less bosses will tell you what to do. The less you argue with them and the more you actually ship, the more and more comfortable they'll get with the idea of, yeah, they work for me. I don't know what they're doing. They're working on this problem. They'll get back to me, <laughs> which is great. It's a great way to live. Now, ultimately, some organizations are, are so deeply committed to this because, you know, it is corporate culture. But, um, but it's surprisingly possible to evade that. As long as you don't rush at it with a spear, right? If you rush at it with a spear, bosses have better armor than you do. And that's not going to work. What, what instead is you really want them on your side. That's, I guess, my answer to that. What else do we have? Anybody else want to comment on either of those, the pairing thing or the hierarchy thing? I, I guess the only comment I would have on the pairing for monotonous work is just wondering what monotonous work are you doing as a if you're doing development uh you know, it, the only monotonous work that you should have in development is if you get stuck supporting something that was poorly developed and then at that point you should be looking into fixing whatever was poorly developed rather than get stuck constantly doing monotonous work right. that, i mean I, so I'm, I mean, I'm young in the in the field I, i'll admit that I, I, i've been only doing it for about two and a half almost three years now and I, I haven't had a single day of monotonous work. Even the boring work was not monotonous. It was still had discovery and uh, figuring out what problem am I solving and then solving the problem, writing a test, solve the problem, then solving the problem. Uh, Cause I do try to stick with TDD um, having followed those courses that uh, I had mentioned earlier today. Um, and for me, the only boring work is if I have to work in a tech stack, I don't like. I guess uh, a couple of things um, just wanted to, add a little bit more color. Um, many times what happens is, especially uh, if you are not used to pair, pair programming, it's like, oh, in the old time, I could have just solved this problem in like 15 minutes. Now I have to teach Dustin and I have to, it's like two brains working on a problem. It's like, I don't think it is productive enough. Well, and... I, would, I would certainly say, you know, God bless you for being the guy who gets stuck with Dustin. <laughs> oh, I have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I would ask um, when you're pair programming, it's not about teaching, though. It's about working together on something. 
you're is. teaching somebody, then maybe you have an intern there that you're helping get onboarded. But that, I find that to be a different situation from pairing. Pairing should be two equals and coming up with a solution together. Although, I will say, before I actually tried to, to, to do any sort of leading in a pair with respect to the problem, I like to make sure that the pair and I both know about pairing. Because, and, and certainly if I'm working with a junior, you know, that would be my first thought. It isn't, isn't going to be actually solving the problem at all. It's going to be making sure they know how to pair. Because pairing is not a natural skill. It is a practiced thing. It involves lots of interesting concepts that are just not, I don't know why we go around expecting everybody to be able to work in a pair or in a mob with no practice and no training especially not when the trade for a long time has has overvalued the concept of the the mastermind working at night in the morgue by themselves the 10x yeah the 10x so but yeah so so on the other hand i agree uh with what was said about uh i'm not usually trying to teach when i'm pairing i I'm trying to have mutual interaction that is beneficial to both of us. On the other hand, I will say this. Teams have to decide how they're going to do things. I would not be comfortable working on a team that, that paired eight hours a day, every day. I totally get it. If somebody said to me, I can't do that. I'd be like, yeah, I get that. I couldn't either. Um, but there are teams that actually do that. However, they don't impose it on anybody. They hire for it. You know, you, the, the first day you walk in for your interview, it becomes clear to you, these guys pair all the time. They never are not pairing or they never are not mobbing. And, you know, to me, that would be just like, you know, this company pays $3 an hour. I'm like, okay, well, I love you, but no, I'm not going to work for $3 an hour and I'm not going to pair eight hours a day. It's no shortage of jobs. What else? So, um, I, I've, I've heard versions of this from you before, you know, on your, on your podcast and stuff. And it makes a lot of sense. And I try to work this way, but where I really run into trouble um, is, is finding often finding a small enough step or, or seeing a path of small steps, even though I maybe can see the destination where I want to go. Mm -hmm. Right. So I just made a new video for uh, We Think Code. It's actually up on, on the gpyhole.org site where I actually walk them through a, a, a spike. And, and the reason that, that it's so important to know about spiking and to know how to do it and to encourage yourself to do it is precisely because if you don't, you won't know where that path is even approximately. Mm. And so, um, so what, I, what I use to solve that problem is I do spikes. Um, short stretches, I mean, anywhere from two hours to a day of uh, programming in the code base, or even actually somewhere else. Sometimes it depends on how, what problem I'm trying to get at, but programming uh, where there's only one rule. You can't keep the code. That's the only rule. You can call variables X. <laughs> you can name classes. I don't know. You can... <laughs> You can avoid, you can write a 60 line method. You can do anything. There are no rules except that one. Whatever you make during a spike, you don't get to keep. And the point of that is to emphasize the fact that the, our, our, our goal in a, of having a spike is not code. Our goal in having a spike is mind and, and heart, confidence, right? And if I can get my mind into it and my heart into it, then I'll be able to figure out a path. But sometimes I have to screw around quite a bit. And sometimes it's just, you know, tech you don't know anything about. I actually did this spike about sockets. I haven't used a socket in, since like 1998 in C++. 
nevertheless, that was the problem. So I had to go learn about sockets quick like a bunny. <laughs> so I think you mentioned earlier that you try to keep your steps to like an hour. So your spikes are potentially way bigger than your steps. Yeah. Interesting. That's, that's opens up different possibilities than I had considered. But, you know, like I'll do stuff in a spike, like change 3000 files, mm. you know, cause I'm just like, I don't care. I, I want this. I want to understand this more than I need to keep this code. I need to, un, I need to understand where the hell we're going with this. Um, I'll also do spikes where I don't even bother. I, I don't even run the production app at all or, or I barely work in it. Instead, I, I'm working out a test and the test is using some of the shipping code, but not, not the core of it, just the pieces I need for just my little problem. Mm -hmm. you know, I was working on a commodities market uh, piece of software, I don't know, three years, four years or so ago. And, and uh, I screwed around with this one user story to the point where I finally realized that, you know, they were asking me to solve a, a, a emerging problem where you could merge, you could merge two items on three different lines and to do it in a, a way that was, you know, structured and coherent. I threw out everything. I didn't use any of the actual commodities, commodity prices. I didn't use any of the actual price data at all. I invented a bunch of, I, I, I built the whole thing using generics off in a separate app and <laughs> learning about how to solve this damn thing. And then at one point it was just like, okay, I get it. I know how you're going to do this. And then I went back to the shipping app and, and had a sense of how to change things so that it would accomplish what I wanted to accomplish. How do you keep that yourself... actually helps a lot. Good, very good. How do you keep yourself honest with TDD? I find the hardest part is not getting carried away with the excitement of, hey, I made that work. Let me start on the next feature before I write the test for it. I, uh, uh, so first of all, I don't always keep myself honest. But, but my, or to the extent that I manage it successfully, I, I, I overcode all the time. I do it constantly. And I bet everybody, every serious TDD or overcodes, you write more code than you got test for. And um, all I do is I just promise myself over and over again, you over, I, I say, I, I, I just caught you overcoding this. <laughs> Better go write that test right now. And that's what I do. And, and, you know, pairing and mobbing helps because there's nothing quite like a bunch of buttheads in a mob telling you you're overcoding before you even start. I have a follow-up question that, that I think I've held on to since the last time I did um, one in Ottinger's courses. But um, when you're writing tests, do you, and you've suddenly developed your, you've gone back to do the refactoring of the code, you've made it more generic where things can be reused more. Do you, will you go back and refactor the test as well? Or is that a moment where you just let the test be and as they're passing? Because I found that sometimes it's, I can take 10 tests down to three, but it still passes all the same code because I've made the code more reusable. Yeah, I don't keep tests as, uh, you know, as um, sacred artifacts. I, I constantly adjust my set of tests. But when I'm changing code, I hold them pretty steady. So I might hold on to those 10 tests until I was done making the change that would enable them to be three and confident that really, even though I know, you know, tests four through nine are actually testing the same thing test three does, uh, <laughs> I'll wait before I get rid of them and then, and then I'll do them. Um, that red green refactor doesn't just apply to the production code, but it applies to the tests as well. Absolutely. Yeah, um, I, and I also, while you were talking, I wanted to build upon what you're saying, but obviously I didn't want to interrupt during your hour. Um, one of the things I really liked about tests as well is not only making it easier to refactor your code, but when you're updating from one version to another, it saves your life. Because you go from, <laughs> I've had multiple apps now where I've had to take it from .NET like 2.2 to 6 and have, making sure it's well tested before you change anything is a lifesaver. Absolutely. Trying to make it so much easier. Yeah, and it's not uncommon, right? I mean, it feels to me, by the time we pile on all the libraries, 
updates are pretty frequent, right? It isn't just that I'm updating .NET down at the bottom, but also this library just changed. Oh, a new version of that just changed. Oh, there's a new version of that guy too. And it, it amounts to actually upgrading your dependencies is more common than we often think of it as being. And the tests are a huge benefit there. I'll let other people take over and ask questions and whatnot. I don't want to take up the whole time. I'm sure I could probably sit here and chat with GPA for many hours, and it, I would l greatly enjoy it. <laughs> well, anybody? I got I got an important question. When you're uh, when you're spiking, and you're trying to find out what the path is. What music do you listen to that's the best for your creativity? I'm sorry, finish the question again. I heard that when I'm spiking and I'm finding out the path, but. Yeah, what music do you listen to? What, uh, oh. what music uh, is, is best for your brain to. Like... I have really weird eclectic musical tastes. I, I asked. <laughs> I'm a multi dork. And uh, amongst other areas of dorkiness, I am a pretty serious amateur musicologist of 20th century American pop. So from, you know, uh, I mean, there's some very few songs before 1925 that are relevant, but not very much, but really from the, the explosion of jazz to, you know, uh, I don't know, TLC or, or, you know, and everything in between. So I listen to a staggering amount of very different music, all in juxtaposition. I very rarely play an album. I have a massive playlist and it's on random shuffle all the time. Uh, so. Am I, am I to understand that you listen, while you're spiking on a story, you're listening to Not Chasing Waterfalls? <laughs> Creep. Don't go chasing waterfalls. Are we recording this still? Yes, sir. This may be my big hit. <laughs> yeah, of course. Why not? Destiny's Child. I'm a survivor. <laughs> no, I, I obviously, yeah, I, I listen to all kinds of stuff. You know, I the, the kind of music I don't listen to that a lot of people listen to when they work is, is you know, uh, classical music. I, I, I am like a classical baby. I know, you know, the nine greatest hits. That's what I know. A lot of people use classical music the whole time they're working. I should pair with somebody sometime for an extended period who's into that and let them choose the music. Uh, we do have a hand up. I don't know. I don't oh, yeah. see names with because of the thing. So I just wanted cool. to point out we did have somebody that has a hand up. Cool. Go ahead. I'm thinking I'm the only one that has my hand up. But um, yeah, so I was um, coming to this as a designer. So I'm constantly working with other developers and content people. And of course, a mix of product and project managers. So how do you get the team to buy into this more? Because this does feel, as you touched on at the end, a very cross-discipline. So I could see designers working very much in this way, but it would really help to work alongside developers working the same way. So right. how do you sell it to the, the larger team other than look at your, uh, send them your articles and hope that they... Right. Well, I think the, probably the best way would be to get them to send me money and then... <laughs> no, the um, so you're you're right. Of course, you know people who actually are artistic are actually quite familiar with this style of working where you don't worry about whether you're going to rework the head of the cat. You you make a big sloppy head for a cat, and then you make a big sloppy body, and then you know if you watch videos of people who draw, you're going to see that they work in exactly the way that that we call evolutionary iterative development. It's software people that are hard ones to talk into this. And uh, I, my experience has been that, that um, every team has leaders who are not the boss. My experience has been that if I close that leaner, I'm in. Because with that leaner and me together, we can get groups mobbing and having fun and learning new stuff a lot of folks just don't know how to think this way. It isn't so much that they have a deep commitment to finished product, 
you know, that whole idea uh, of never changing anything as it is that it's everything they learned. It's, it's how they learned how to program and they just don't know that there's another way to do it. I mean, the first time I showed somebody, well, now we've gotten into walking skeleton, a walking skeleton where it went from A all the way to Z and all the way back out, right? Uh, from pixels <laughs> to registers to pixels. Um, except that it only did one thing badly and it, it did not handle any sort of exceptional or unusual occurrence in any way. You know, it, it, uh, think of it like a, a payroll, a payroll program that will pay you as long as your name is G. Paw Hill, you work 40, to 40 hours, <laughs> you get paid $13 an hour, there's no union dues, and all of your, uh, 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 you know, you've declined deductions for taxes. As long as you're that guy, I can ship payroll. And developers aren't used to that. They're, they're much more trained to think about all of the different millions of things that could, that could happen in a payroll. But the first time they see the G Paw Hill check coming off the printer, they're like, well, I'll be damned. That's the right check. And then they realize, you know, what if a person's situation was exactly the same, but their name wasn't G Paw Hill? Could we solve that? <laughs> No, and then you'd be like, "Yeah, we can solve that," uh, you know. And and all of this comes down to me for, to this idea: create experiences, not arguments, right? And there's nothing quite like having something work when it's under your fingers, when you did it and it worked. And I am a professional coach, which means I'm corrupt. Uh, I am willing to engineer success. I, I'm. <laughs> I'm willing to guarantee they win uh, by using various nefarious means. Um, but that's because I'm a professional coach. I'm not, you know, in the company. I'm paid to create change, not to ship widgets. And so, you know, uh, I, I'll, I will set up a situation in which I actually know the answer exactly. And I know exactly how they would solve the problem. And I know exactly what, what glitches they're going to find as they approach it. And then say, all right, let's go do this <laughs> with my little sweet, innocent face. But of course, I've already done it. So I know exactly where the problems are going to be, how to direct them, how to help them. When they get to the end of solving that problem in their first mob, you know what? They're going to be high on life because they had an experience rather than me telling them you should always mob. They had an experience that was joyful and successful. Thanks. Absolutely. Miles, I really shouldn't have 19 more of these, but I do have just a little bit, a little bit left in this one little shot. All right, well, I exhausted you guys. I guess that's good. Justin, what do you say? Uh, yeah, I, I know we could we could sit and talk for a long time, and, and we have. Um, I'm trying not to be too selfish here. See if anybody else has I, uh, questions. Um, I'm going to assume I'm going to assume that there's a lot of people who are listening to this saying, "Yeah, this all makes a lot of sense." But my company, oh man. Things are different there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Especially in the cases, I think, too, um, a lot of the examples we go through are that new feature development and going through the muck of years of people working under timeline pressure yep. to get stuff out the door and shove things in wherever they fit and trying to um, pull that thread out, trying to clean those systems up. I think that um, it, the, the model still fits. Yeah, it does. That's the beauty of it. But, but it's harder to get your 
to get all psyched and hearted up about it, right? One of the things that I would like every executive on earth to understand is that it is over the next 10 years, and you know, I'm 62. Please, God, don't let me still be doing this when I'm 72. But over the next 10 years, it is no longer going to be possible to be profitable by writing bad software badly. And if I could get every executive in America to understand this, I mean, we've been, we've had, we had a great run. And, and you know what I mean? I mean, you're talking about a doubling rate for developers of every five years and change for the last 40 years. That means that there are 13, there are 26 million programmers in the world. There are 13 million programmers in the world who have less than five years of experience. Now, I don't know what it was like the last time you called a plumber, but I guarantee you that the plumber who came to your place had more than five years of experience. And here we are in this trade where that's considered enough. In fact, we mostly don't even train developers or nurture them. We just, we just show them the pointy end of the code editor and say, go over the wall and fight the Bosch. And, and it's, it's really bad. And, and, you know, my big mission to the extent that I, I, I decided not to call it a mission anymore, because if it's a mission, you have to feel bad when you don't pull it off. But if it's a hobby, then cool. It's just a hobby. You know, it's keeping me entertained. So my big hobby is trying to convince uh, the entire trade that you got to change or it's going to kill you. You're not going to be able to make money like you used to make by writing crappy code in a crappy way. You're only going to be able to make money by writing good code or possibly by writing bad code, but in a good way, one or the other. But you can't keep going both of those bad bads. We're going to run out of, we're going to run out of demand. We really are. Um, you know, my, my friend, Ben Simo, I don't know if you guys know Ben Simo on, on the internet, uh, on Twitter. Quality Frog is his handle, has this wonderful capacity. He's been in this game for 30 years, right? And he's a tester. And every time he sees a piece of bad software in his ordinary life, not talking about, you know, work, just talking about ordinary life, he encounters a piece of crap. He gets infuriated on the internet. And, and it's beautiful because he, he seems to be so shocked that <laughs> software doesn't work. <laughs> And I know Ben, and I know he's not shocked, but something about his makeup is just, he's just outraged that software doesn't work. And you know what? Software mostly works. Um, all the critical software actually works pretty well. It's the crap software that doesn't work. And it ain't making any people any money. You know, most executives regard their IT departments as a sort of infinite capacity toilet down which they flush capital every year. That's how they actually view it. And what I want to say to them is you can change this. You can get an organization that actually writes good software well instead of bad software badly. But like I say, it's my hobby. It's not my mission. Kill myself if I worry about it too much. Any last questions? And, and as you can see, I don't really think there are any questions that are off limits. <clears throat> cool. All right. Folks, I've had a, I had a really pleasant time. Um, um, for those of you who, you know, connect to other user groups, because I know they exist, you can always give me a holler. I believe in user groups. I came up in user groups. I learned to, to geek uh, <laughs> largely through user groups and zines. And uh, so I always approve of that sort of thing and I always try to do it. I don't think we can change the world if, if we only ever talk to people for money. And I don't think we can change the world if we, um, if we don't talk to every person we can possibly talk to. So give me a holler. Also, I'm G. Paul Hill on Twitter. If you get questions that occur to you tomorrow morning when you're taking a shower, that's fine too. Just ping me. Thank you so much. Before we before we, you go, uh, G Paul, it was awesome being able to hear you talk and I, I get the chance to chat with you after watching quite a few of your videos. So, and an honor. Thanks. Great, thank you. That's very kind. I, I really appreciate that.
Thank you very much. And, and I appreciate you guys sticking around and, and having a good conversation. Yep. Take care of yourselves. Uh, we'll see you in a month with uh, Chet Hendrickson and uh, hopefully engaging on Twitter or other means more frequently. So, oh, it's good. So, Chet Hendrickson's going to be there next month? Yeah. Yeah. You walked out. Um, I invited Chet because, um, I mean, the, the core of the reason was I got sick and tired of people talking about this is what a user story is. So, I wanted Chet to give his little story and to talk with the C3. I, I want to hear like what happened back then and, and where, what did we learn? Where have we gone? I need to rig up some kind of practical joke to screw Chet over. I'll get back to you, Dustin. All right. Cinco de Mayo here. <laughs> cool. <laughs> All right. Thanks folks for having me. I had a great time. Have a good night. Yes. Take care. Thank you. Thanks everyone.